Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Mayville and I'm going to give an introduction to the use of visualizers in the physics classroom. Now I emphasize here introduction because you can do a lot more with visualizers than I'm going to go through in the next five to ten minutes. Now before I go through um, some of the uses of visualizers in the physics classroom, I'm just going to give a short summary of the three main visualizers that a lot of teachers talk about that you can get and use. So the three are here, there's two from Hue and the IPVO V4K. Now, my personal preference is the IPVO. Yes, it is very expensive at $99.99, especially for certain science departments and individuals. However, uh, at 4K resolution and with all the functions it has, like automatic zoom and focus, it does make doing demos and various things a lot easier than the Hues. Now, yes, the Hues are uh, very good in their own right, but I just find for physics and science, the 720 resolution isn't sharp enough for some of the things that you want to do, uh, and it's and as well as the manual focus and zoom isn't quite um, doesn't help either. Now, what is also something to be aware of is that the HD Pro and the IP V four K have software included, and both software is very very good. However, the HD does not come with software, and when I used to use that, I had issues with the um, how compatible it was with my laptop. Now that might be just my laptop, but it's just something to maybe be aware of. Now having summarised the three visualisers, what I'm going to do is now go on to certain examples that I use in the physics classroom. The first one being uh, going through a student's piece of work. So for example, here is a typical question that I gave to my year 10s last week. It was obviously online. But it's nothing different from what I would normally do in the classroom. It is a SUVAC question, so something that can be quite tricky, especially for GCSE classes, now that it's been brought from A level down to GCSE. This student has sent me her question and answer, and she automatically can see that she has got it wrong down here, that's why she's put the X. So I'm going to go through her piece of work as if I was in the classroom now. So switch over to my visualizer here. So I've written her question and answer out exactly how she had it. And what I would do is I'll ask her, can I take this up to front of the classroom? And she would say, yes, that's absolutely fine. Most of my classes are quite used to me showing their work now. And the first thing I'll probably do is, okay, guys, what has this uh, student done well? And immediately a lot of what they'll say is that they remembered the square root. Okay, so that's good. And they remembered the method I showed them for using SUVAP by writing the letters down the side here. So that's also good. And then I'd probably ask, okay, what have they um, done wrong or what can they improve on? And some students would probably say, well, they have got the values wrong here. So, okay, brilliant. So what I do is I actually now go through it. So, okay, what does S actually stand for? Well, S is our displacement or distance, but ideally the displacement. So here you'd spot in the question the distance is 350 meters. And right here, 350 meters. And then I say, okay, what is u? And I say the initial velocity of speed. So then here it's accelerated from 2 meters per second. So then I'd write here 2 meters per second. And the girl actually spotted that here, but she just didn't write it over there. The next one is v. What it's asking is to calculate the final velocity, so we don't have that. And then next up, is A is the acceleration, which we have right here. Okay, so she's actually got that correct. I'm just trying to focus. And so she's got that correct. She's also spotted that really we don't need T for this question, so we can just ignore that. Now, putting this into the rest of our question. She's probably noticed now already what she's got wrong. And you could write out the rest of the question for the class. And v squared equals 2 times 0 0.2 times 350 instead of 2, which is what she had here. Let's move that along. Here. And plus 4. And then therefore v would equal the square root 144 and therefore v equals 12 meters per second okay remembering the units which is one of the things that she missed here now 
Our next problem that I'm going to go on to is going through a complicated problem from a, a worksheet, an exam, or a textbook. So here is the problem that I'm going to go through. Okay, it's from the textbook. It is a typical conservation of momentum problem. As you can see, it's got two uh, trucks or wagons. They're going to hit each other, and they're going to stick together, and they're going to find the velocity after the collision. So let's go through this problem now. I already have certain things already drawn out to save us some time. Okay, um, I would normally draw these along with the class in the lesson. And what the first question was asking us to do was work out the momentum okay, of wagon A. And this was wagon A, and this was wagon B. So I normally ask a student, what's our equation for momentum? And they'd hopefully be able to tell me that momentum equals mass times velocity. Okay, well, what's our mass? Well, in the question, mass is a thousand for trolley A, and our velocity is five. And therefore, our total momentum of trolley A is 5,000 kilograms meters per second. Okay. And I'd hope that most students would be able to do that properly. Now, the next one is the one that a lot of students have problems with. It was asking, what is the velocity of the wagons after the collision if they are stuck together? Now, the key thing to remember, if you get students to remember, is well, what is the total mass? Here is going to be 2,500 kilograms. And then I'd ask students, OK, well, the whole lesson is about conserv conservation of momentum. So what does conservation of momentum actually mean? And hopefully they'll be able to remember from our talking about it earlier in the lesson that the momentum before the collision equals the momentum after the collision. OK, we have momentum beforehand that we worked out was 5,000 and our momentum afterwards has to equal 5,000. Um, and then you'd say, well, OK, we need to find the velocity. Our momentum calculation again is mass times velocity. Let's plug in our numbers. We know that the momentum afterwards is 5,000. Our mass now is 2,500. And then you go for and complete it with your students. Okay. And I'll complete it for the people that I know would want me to. All the while, you can ask your students uh, questions to do with this. Now, I do get a lot of teachers asking me, well, why can't I just do this on a whiteboard rather than doing it with a visualizer? Now, the good things I find that doing it with a visualizer is that. Um, you can focus on your students a lot more by making yourself face the class rather than if you use a whiteboard your back can be to the class and also this way you're not really covering up a lot of your problem whereas if you're standing in front of a whiteboard a lot of the time you're kind of covering up uh, what you're doing plus i normally find that a smart board is better located in a room for all the students to see rather than if you're doing it on a whiteboard, that's normally positioned maybe slightly off to the side or things like that. Not all students can see it as easily. Um, and as you can see, this whole method is quite clear. You can leave it up on the board for students to see as they go through their own problems. And um, you can highlight various things. Like as you were going through, you could have gone, well, the, I'm looking for the mass. The mass up here was 2,500. That. And you can use different highlighters to go through and show different things. Okay. Now, the last thing I'm going to go through is a reflection demo, which I know that at year 7, 8, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 um, can be quite difficult for a lot of students, especially if you're doing one small demo at the front of the class uh, while all the students are going to watch. OK, I'm just going to take away this and get my equipment ready. So bear with me because I'm having to make shift practical on lockdown at home. So here is my sheet of paper, which you would normally get a lot of your students in this practical to have a nice plain piece of paper. And you would get them to grab a mirror each. So I'm just going to set up my mirror. Here. 
and what I'm going to do is go through it as if I was with my class. So I would normally say to get your mirror and your paper ready, draw your line along the edge of your mirror, as so. Again, let's try and focus on this. Okay, there we go, it's focused. So now I'll take my mirror away and you'd usually get your students just to uh, draw in some dash lines like I started to here and label it mirror. And then you say, okay, we're all up to that point, brilliant. So let's draw in our normal line. And you could show them exactly what you mean by normal line by showing them 90 degrees here. And matching up your points with a nice dashed line. And you can label that normal. It's a good way to check that all your students know how to use a protractor as well, which I find when I first started doing this, it can be an issue. And then the next bit is you can get them to pick one or two angles. I'm just going to move this out of the way. Um, and I'm just going to pick one angle for now, just to save time. And I'm going to pick an angle of 40 degrees, just there. don't know why I always seem to pick 40 degrees. Then you can have every student ready at that point. You can also, if you wish, depending on your group, get them to in label the incident ray and your angle of incidence. And immediately, before we even started the practical, every student was up to that point. Okay, and you've gone through this on the Bond Visualizer step by step with them, and I find that it makes it a lot simpler and easier for students. So now back to the practical, you can get them to Again, line up their mirror with their board, if I'm able to with mine. Again, bear with me. There we go. And I'm going to get my ray box. As you can see, it's a makeshift piece of cardboard. Place it there. And my torch. Let's see if we can do this. No. There we go. I don't think I'm going to be too accurate with this, but you'll get the point. Now there you can get, show them, mark your point here, and you can see where it comes off of there. And that's what they need to do. Okay, you can show them. It takes literally five seconds to do. So you're not spending 20, 25 minutes doing a reflection practical, which takes two or three minutes. i move away my equipment. And I'm going to join up my points. Not sure how... Accurate. Again, I said I'm going to be here, but we'll see what angle this gives me. You can then show them again what you need them to do afterwards. Oh, quite a bit off here. 20, where am I? 10, 20, 30, 40, oh, 49, I believe that is. So I'm quite a way off here by using my home equipment. Um, but you'll probably hopefully get better uh, in the classroom rather than what I was using. So then you can get them to label this angle of reflection, the reflection ray, and you can get various students work and bring it up on the board. And hopefully after showing 5, 10, 20 or even just collecting results, you can show that these two angles should, unlike mine, be the same. And therefore you can show them that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Okay. Now again, teachers do ask me, why do I bother to do this on a visualizer rather than a whiteboard or just going through a picture on the board? Now this way does reduce the cognitive load and also doing it step by step makes it a lot easier for your students and again for behavior management engagement reasons you'll realize straight away how much better this is than just going through on a whiteboard or on a through a picture on the board now especially for dissection things like as well going through a dissection on um, a visualizer is so much better than getting your students to stand around watching you do a very intricate small uh, dissection 
Now there are some other benefits. I'm just going to go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, these are some of the other things I use it for. It is very good, again, for doing small, intricate demos and practicals like building a motor. Okay, if anyone's ever done that practical, they will realize that it can be quite intricate. Uh, intricate. And by doing it with a visualizer, you can go for it step by step and show all the little small details, especially if you've got um, a visualizer with good resolution. Now, it's also excellent for going through exams. And I found that instead of just putting a March team on the board, it makes it a lot more engaging for students for you to essentially go through the exam with them, go through their questions and their answers that they have rather than just putting the mark scheme up on the board and them trying to copy it down in a rush whilst you talk to them. Um, now, I've also added in a slide here about the benefits and drawbacks. Most of the benefits come from uh, reducing the cognitive load and e helping students uh, with engagement, things like that in the lesson. But it, I also found it's been very good for personal CPD. You can record yourself doing practicals and demos and watch back your explanations as you go through it, which is also an, another excellent tool you can use these for. Some of the drawbacks is that, like I've said before, teacher focus sometimes can be on the paper in front of them rather than being interactive with their own class, uh, similar to how teachers sometimes can be with whiteboards. So just be aware that, you know, don't just focus solely on the paper in front of you or the whiteboard in front of you to interact your class. And also, again, like most teaching things, it does require some practice. You can't just go immediately into it and try and wing it first off. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.